Ivy Mode. Good evening and welcome to IVD Medicine Cabinet, what's available and what's coming. coming. A webinar presented by the Northwest Chapter of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America in partnership with Virginia Mason Medical Center. My name is Trina Seligman. I'm a naturopathic doctor, an acupuncturist, and a member of the mission committee of the CCFA, and I've participated in 16 challenge events. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about CCFA and what we do here. CCFA's mission is to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these diseases. CCFA works to achieve the two parts of this mission through funding research and education and support programs to help people living with Crohn's and colitis. CCFA is the leading supporter and funder of medical research in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, funding the best IBD research in the world. With a total of over $169 million invested, CCFA has played a role in every major scientific breakthrough in IBD. CCFA holds in-person education programs throughout the country. These events provide an opportunity for patients to ask providers questions and meet others going through similar experiences. Local healthcare providers speak on topics such as treatment options, nutrition, coping, and pediatric issues. Professional education ensures that providers can treat their patients with the best practices in IBD care. CCFA holds live webcasts featuring expert providers and researchers in the field of IBD, then post replays at ccfa.org slash resources slash webcasts. Don't miss the upcoming series, Know Your IBD, with Understanding Crohn's Disease on October 16th, Understanding Ulcerative Colitis on October 23rd, and what to know about biologic therapy in IBD on October 30th. CCFA holds volunteer-driven support groups held monthly in communities around the country for people with IBD and their families. For group locations and meeting times, as well as guidelines for starting a new group, please see ccfa.org. Our Power of Two program matches those seeking support with volunteers who have gone through similar experiences with IBD, either as a patient or a caregiver. The two speak on the phone or by email. Applications to participate can be found on CCFA's Find a Support Group webpage. Our free online community provides a venue where you can participate in discussion boards, read personal stories, ask a question to our panel of experts, and much more at ccfacommunity.org. Camp Oasis is a special program for kids and teens aged 7 to 18 living with Crohn's or colitis. There are 12 camps around the U.S. The Northwest location is in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. Camp Oasis is a safe place where they can feel normal with their peers and have the chance to try things they've never done. Volunteer counselors and 24-7 medical staff make this week possible. These education and support programs and the critical research being conducted are funded in part by our fundraising programs. Take Steps is a community event bringing together patients, family and friends, and healthcare providers with a shared goal to find a cure for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Participants raise funds and awareness in the months leading up to the event to help make an impact in the fight against inflammatory bowel diseases. On the day of the walk, participants will gather together for festivities and a two to three mile walk. Join us for Take Steps and help us spread more knowledge and awareness and raise crucial funds for a cure. Find the walk in your community at cctakesteps.org. <clears throat> Team Challenge is an endurance training program that provides professional coaching and a supportive team to help you train for an endurance event, run or walk, cycle and triathlon, while you fundraise for cures to Crohn's and colitis. Learn more at ccteamchallenge.org. 
Here's a quick look at who we've got on the phone tonight. I hope this will make it feel a little less anonymous, even though we can't see each other. If you have a question during the program, please type it into the question box on your control panel on the right side of your screen. Once our presenter has finished his presentation, I will read the questions out loud and the presenter will answer for everyone to hear. During the presentation, we may ask for audience feedback on our control panel. You will see a little hand. Click this to raise your virtual hand. Please try it now. Yeah. Okay, good. We will be recording this presentation and it will be available for replay. I will send the link to all our registrants once it's done. And now I'd like to introduce our, pre our presenter, Dr. Michael Kiorian. Dr. Kiorian is a gastroenterologist at Virginia Mason Medical Center. He is director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center of Excellence at Virginia Mason Digestive Disease Institute. He serves on the CCFA Northwest Chapter Medical Advisory Committee, and he also volunteers on a national level with the CCFA National Patient Education Committee. Thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Kiori. Muted. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Trina and Kathleen, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in the CCFA virtual meeting room. Um, and as Trina said, I was ta tasked tonight to talk to you about the uh, medicine cabinet. Um, a guide for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, the objectives of this talk will be to go through some gener generalities uh, about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and we'll spend the, the greatest part of my talk on medications current, and, and we'll have some slides at the end about some medications in the pipeline. Uh, you will find, as you'll see uh, towards the end, a lot more information on the references that we quoted at the end of this presentation, all of which is available on the CCFA website. So let's move on with, uh, to the first section, Life with IBD. As you, most of you know, you're not alone. There are 1.5 million Americans with inflammatory bowel disease, about halfly split between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. The, these are both lifelong conditions which require chronic therapy, spontaneous remission, even if it's possible, it's extremely uncommon. Uh, and patients, importantly, patients in medical remission have normal lifestyles. So this is sometimes a misunderstanding that I frequently see among patients that I uh, see in the office. Uh, the symptoms, course of disease, and prognosis may differ from person to person and cannot be generalized. And this applies in particular to patients with Crohn's disease. The most important part uh, message here is that the biggest risk factor for illness, loss of productivity, and disability is poorly controlled disease. This supersedes any side effects from any medications that we use to treat these conditions. So I put here this slide just to kind of give you an idea uh, overall about what are the risks of the disease so that we understand better the slides that are following about medical treatment. So as you can see here on the left side, patients with Crohn's disease, uh, the majority of them will have, will need surgery uh, up to 75 percent in some studies throughout their lifetime. And the bad news here is that surgery is not a cure. Patients who had one surgery for Crohn's disease generally require at least one or multiple surgeries throughout their lifetime. With ulcerative colitis, things are a little bit better. Uh, also from the standpoint of the risk of surgery, which is only about 20 to 30 percent, but also the fact that surgery is relatively curative, we call it. So patients can return to a somewhat normal lifestyle after uh, surgery, but still a substantial proportion of patients will lose their colon due to uncontrolled disease or other complications. So with this background, we're going to look at 
what are IBD and what are the treatment options for it. So inflammatory bowel diseases are not irritable bowel syndrome or spastic colon. They're not food intolerance, not food allergies or indigestion. They're not an infection as far as we know and we've looked pretty hard uh, for it. And there is no uh, bowel damage in any of the uh, diseases that I mentioned earlier. So irritable bowel syndrome is a condition where the uh, intestine and the colon are perfectly normal. In contrast, inflammatory bowel diseases are uh, the result of an overactive immune system. The target for that uh, overactivity is unknown, but the damage is clear. It occurs in the uh, bowel. It is chronic and usually progressive, especially in Crohn's disease. But the good news, again, it's treatable and reversible for the most part, unless the damage is very uh, advanced. So what are the potential causes for IBD? This is still uh, a, a mystery uh, and most of the, the causes are unknown. We know that there is a genetic predisposition, although that's responsible for a minority of patients with IBD. Only about 20% will have a family history. Usually it's in second degree relatives. Even twin studies, whether identical or not, have shown that the majority of twins will not have uh, disease even if their, uh, their uh, sibling does. So other factors may be uh, at play, and we discussed a little bit about the immune system, which is overactive, and what triggers the immune system or activity is unknown. Uh, there are probably environmental factors, and these are studied increasingly over the last, they have been studied uh, with increased interest over the last few decades, uh, and this includes uh, early life infections or lack thereof, uh, early use of antibiotics, non uh, drugs, smoking, diet, and, and stress. Uh, what do we know, though, there's a, a geographical distribution of these, uh, of these disorders, which are more concentrated in the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere for some reason. And obviously, in the end, there's probably an interplay between these major factors, uh, genes, immune system abnormalities, and environmental factors. So now let's look at a few differentiating features between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and most of you are probably privy to this information, but I'm going to review it briefly. As far as ulcerative colitis is concerned, this is a disease that's confined to the colon. It's somewhat progressive from the rectum uh, towards the upstream, uh, but the rectum is always involved. The small bowel is always normal. Uh, we do not see fistulas with ulcerative colitis. And I put there that smoking may be protective, not in as far as smoking being used as as therapy, but uh, there are uh, there's a disproportionate number of patients with ulcerative colitis among ex-smokers than current smokers. So frequently we see patients whose disease onset started after they quit smoking, or they had a flare after they stopped smoking. This is not to say that smoking is not still harmful, so that the damaging effects of smoking are uh, very diverse and, and universal. Uh, but it is uh, somewhat of a trade-off in that instance. In contrast, Crohn's disease uh, skips, uh, it, but it can involve any part of the GI system, literally from the mouth to the anus. Uh, the rectum is variably involved. The colon, in fact, as a whole is only involved, involved in about 20 to 30 percent of patients. Small bowel is very frequently involved, fistulae are common, unfortunately, and smoking is typically harmful, and it can, leave, it can lead to progressive bowel damage. So this slide here, which is a bit busy, shows the com uh, complexities of the IBD management. It's not only about medical treatment, but also about nutrition, as Trina discussed earlier, treating inflammation, controlling symptoms, preventing disability and irreversible damage. Uh, uh, minimizing treatment toxicity, and to some extent in that regards, uh, we, we consider surgery in, in some patients as uh, something that we're trying to avoid. And then lastly, I put it there at the top, providing emotional support, which is uh, very, very important uh, for most patients as they're, uh, they're all young um, and uh, young in their career and, and their family pursuits. So. Uh, in this slide, you see the one, uh, one of the um, uh, therapeutic strategies, strategies in inflammatory bowel disease. This uh, slide specifically addresses ulcerative colitis. And uh, the so-called step-up pyramid uh, for ulcerative colitis still applies today, probably in a, a, the majority of patients. 
And essentially, what as this figure shows, we're moving from the bottom, the first step of the ladder, where we use medications which are extremely safe and effective for patients with mild moderate disease, uh, to steroids, immunomodulators, biologics, and surgery. And the reason for moving up the ladder is failure of the previous drug. So this is a, a classic step up uh, pyramid. And of course, in patients who have, as you see here on the right side, in patients who have uh, more moderate disease or they fail to respond to these medications all the way to the top. We have uh, off-label therapy or clinical trials and these address particular patients with moderate to severely active disease because in general we consider that patients with mildly active disease, active disease are fairly well served uh, currently. In contrast, the situation with Crohn's disease is a little bit different and this is because you see this curve here uh, on the slide which is basically the probability of having surgery in, in uh, Crohn's disease patients over time. And as this graph very nicely demonstrates, this is actually older data, but when we looked at the same phenomenon in the last uh, uh, 10 or 20 years, the curve has flattened out a, a little bit, but it's still uh, escalating. So uh, after about 20 to 30 years of disease, the majority of patients with Crohn's disease will have had at least one surgery. So there's clearly a sense of urgency when we treat patients with Crohn's disease and particularly uh, 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 related to their disease severity. And thus the uh, treatment for Crohn's disease is no longer a therapeutic pyramid where we're, we're waiting for a drug to fail in order to move on, but we stratified patients actually based on their disease severity and mild, moderate uh, and aggressive disease and we treat each group appropriately with their, with their corresponding drugs. So a patient with aggressive disease, we frequently start at the top of the pyramid where we use uh, biologics either alone or frequently in combination with immunomodulators as opposed to patients with mild disease which sometimes do well with uh, just intermittent steroids, uh, budesonide. I put a question mark uh, around the 5-ASA. These are medications that are extremely safe uh, they're effective for ulcerative colitis, but their benefit for Crohn's disease is probably nil uh, or unclear. They are still frequently used because of their safety issue. So uh, I will leave that there. Immunomodulators, of course, are uh, the uh, maintenance drugs uh, that are fairly effective for patients with moderate disease. And those who fail, then we move on to biologic therapy. So what are the risk factors? What are the predictors of aggressive disease? And you have them in the right box, right upper quadrant, uh, being young at diagnosis, uh, having fistulas, smokers tend to have significantly worse disease, particularly among women, having extensive disease. And this is uh, specifically because it puts a lot of real estate at risk. So there's a large extent of bowel that's at risk of surgery in case of a complication in patients who have extensive disease. And the same thing applies to severe lesions that we see either at endoscopy slash colonoscopy or with, with x-ray, so with the radio radiological studies. Patients who are at low risk have none of the above risk factors and patients with intermediate risk are somewhere in uh, between. So again, uh, similar to patients with ulcerative colitis, we have a number of clinical trials for patients with uh, uh, moderate to severe Crohn's disease and sometimes we still have to resort to off-label therapy for patients who have more challenging uh, situations. So this diagram uh, in the next slide shows basically how uh, early consistent treatment is associated with an increased chance of staying well. And the, this diagram basically moves from the state of good health where the or remission where basically the key is on disease prevention or maintenance of remission to subclinical inflammation. This is where the disease is certainly uh, very treatable to patients who have symptomatic inflammation and then complications. As, and as we move to the right of this diagram, uh, the disease is increasingly di more difficult to treat and the results are increasingly less satisfactory and the result of this is obviously where we don't want to uh, arrive or reach, uh, which is disability. So we're going to move on now to uh, understanding treatment options and reviewing the medication categories. Uh, some of the most uh, commonly encountered, uh, we classify them as over-the-counter prescription 
and then uh, we're going to talk briefly about complementary and alternative therapies. So over-the-counter drugs, these are very, very frequently utilized by uh, uh, all patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it's important to remember here that these address only specific symptoms such as diarrhea and pain. They have no real effect on, for the most part, on the inflammatory, on inflammation per se. One thing very important to remember is that NSAIDs, or what, how we, the, uh, what we call non-selective NSAIDs, such as aspirin and ibuprofen uh, and the like, may cause or worsen GI irritation, may actually trigger flares in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. In contrast, medications like acetaminophen are safe. Probiotics, uh, these are uh, now currently available over the counter in a wide variety of products. Uh, they may also help decrease certain symptoms such as gas and pain, possible benefit in patients with mild ulcerative colitis, but there's no benefit in patients with more severe disease, and as far as we know, uh, no benefit at all in patients with Crohn's disease. But they are very safe, of course. So moving to antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics have proven benefit in a few conditions such as pouchitis, and this is inflammation of the uh, a small bowel pouch that the surgeon creates after they remove the colon in patients with ulcerative colitis. They also seem to be beneficial short term for patients with fistulas and certainly are one of the important lines of therapy for patients who have Crohn's related abscesses. There, there are some risks with antibiotics and that includes bacterial resistance. They may be associated with, this, uh, with uh, ulcerative colitis flares. And probably the biggest risk, especially with broad spectrum antibiotics, is the C. difficile. And this has seen literally an epidemic over the last 15 years because of the widespread use of antibiotics. And several studies now, um, uh, uh, healthcare outcome studies have shown that less than 5% of antibiotic prescriptions for upper respiratory infections are actually indicated based on guidelines. So there's probably an overuse of antibiotics which leads to C. difficile, which in turn can lead to flares, particularly of uh, ulcerative colitis, and these can be very, very difficult to treat. Examples of antibiotics uh, among the most commonly used, ciprofloxacin and, and metronidazole. We also use occasionally rifaximin because it is, uh, it is not distributed in the circulation in the system, so it's got restricted. Uh, amoxicillin and many, many others can be used. They're fairly interchangeable and fairly similar, although I have to emphasize here that ciprofloxacin and, flagella and metronidazole are probably the most commonly used uh, drugs. So moving on to aminosalicylates, these are very, very uh, familiar drugs to most of us. Uh, they have clear benefits in ulcerative colitis for induction and maintenance of therapy. They're extremely safe uh, and uh, they have very few serious side effects. They still require some basic monitoring. We still do blood work uh, on patients on 5-ASA maybe once or twice a year. Limitations, uh, they're not effective for Crohn's disease, uh, virtually any severity, uh, but that is really uh, their only uh, shortcoming. So formulations, again, these are relatively common and almost part of the vernacular now. But we have pure mesalamine drugs, which is strictly 5-ASA. They deliver 100% of drug. And you have examples there, uh, which include Lealda, Acecol, Prism, Fantaza, have rectal suppositories of suspension. Uh, and then we have a couple of prodrugs. These are drugs that have to be broken down in the intestine in order to become effective. Uh, and that includes uh, balsalazide, which comes in a generic form, and sulfasalazine, which is really the oldest drug in this category, still fairly effective and actually uh, inexpensive. So a few tips for patients, and this applies in, to all 5-ASA preparations. All of them can be taken once or twice daily. I think I still see a fair number of patients refer to our center who are on three uh, times per day therapy. The only thing that this, this leads to is more missed doses, lower overall dose, and lower efficacy, what, what, or what we otherwise call in the medical, uh, medical lingo, uh, non-compliance. So most of them are now formulated so that uh, they can be very easily taken with the same effectiveness once or twice a day. Uh, the other important tip is that their, uh, uh, their efficacy is equivalent per same dose. So you have to look at the amount of milligrams of the product that you're taking uh, in order to get the same efficacy, particularly if you're switching drugs. 
The efficacy window uh, window for the 5-ASA drugs for the pure drug itself is 1.6 grams to 4.8 grams. Uh, and for pro-drugs, because they're diluted, quote, unquote, uh, you have to multiply by about 2.5. So, for instance, uh, 1.6 grams of salamine or, or acecol, so to speak, would be uh, uh, the equivalent of 4 grams of sulfasalazine. Moving on to steroids. Uh, they have clear benefits uh, and they're very effective in inducing remission in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They're literally, they are the fastest agents know, known in these disorders. Unfortunately, they all, that comes at a, at a steep price. They have numerous, numerous side effects, some of them very significant, including infections. Uh, currently, we recognize the steroids as being the number one risk factors for uh, infections in patients with IBD. Aside from that, virtually every system in the body can be affected by steroids, and that includes diabetes, eye and skin tissues, bone and muscle loss, and then the famous psychological side effects. Uh, some of these are reversible upon discontinuing the steroids. Some of them are irreversible, uh, and for example, the cataracts. Um, so example of steroid preparations, probably the most common and well-known one is prednisone. Uh, we also have uh, non-systemic steroids, so-called, and that includes budesonide and budesonide MMX. Uh, hydrocortisone, which can be utilized as an enema, and then meth methylprednisolone, which is an intravenous preparation. Uh, immunomodulators moving on to the next class, so we're now moving towards the uh, top of the pyramid, second line drugs, so to speak. Uh, these drugs as a class, they're used to quiet down the immune system uh, and overall they have similar properties, similar efficacy. Uh, they're a steroid sparing maintenance drug. Uh, they're also effective for postoperative prevention. Uh, because they're very slow acting, we usually need another drug for induction in patients who have active disease and they have much fewer side effects compared to steroids and they're also relatively inexpensive to uh, the drugs that are on the uh, next higher ladder or, or a step of the ladder. Uh, there are obvious risks with immunomodulators. These are medications that suppress the immune system, but aside from that there are certain early reactions which are drug specific and that include uh, fever, allergies, pancreatitis, and hepatitis. Other more uh, sort of traditional adverse events, bone marrow suppression that's usually manifested as low white uh, blood cells that's fairly uncommon or very uncommon. Uh, elevated liver tests, infections, particularly viral infections, lymphoma, and skin cancer. As far as pregnancy, there are two drugs that are X, so uh, categorically not and those are methotrexate and thalidomide. So examples, probably the most commonly used in this country is azathioprine and its equivalent or similar drug 6-mercaptopurine or 6-MP, both available in generic form. Also frequently utilized methotrexate uh, and then we have a number of off-label, so to speak, drugs. In essence, all of these drugs are off-label since they're not approved by the FDA, but traditionally uh, used are azathioprine and methotrexate. Uncommonly used nowadays, tacrolimus, cyclosporine, mycophenolate, and thalidomide. Moving on to the top of the letter, and here we have the biologic drugs. And these are designer-targeted drugs made to specifically block inflammation, uh, similar to smart weapons, so uh, targeted therapies. Most or all of them are immunoglobulins or fragments thereof. They have a narrower spectrum of activity compared to the immunomodulators that I discussed earlier. They're relatively fast-acting, sometimes uh, approaching the steroids, but they also uh, have risks, and that includes immune suppression, infusion or injection reactions, uh, lymphoma, uh, skin cancer. Of course, loss of responses of a concern uh, is a concern uh, even more than with immunomodulators because these drugs are protein that can actually trigger an immune response of their own, so patients can develop antibodies and therefore uh, lose response to medications. And I know there is a question from the audience in this regard that I'll be happy to review in a little bit. And then there is obviously the cost uh, issue. So we have two classes of drugs currently. 
uh, for treatment of IBD, uh, anti-TNF drugs, which include adalimumab, sertolizumab, infliximab, and golimumab. Uh, aside from uh, the, the fact that they all work through the same mechanism, which is blocking this chemical, this molecule called TNF-alpha, which uh, promotes inflammation. The other common denominator is that they're all very difficult to pronounce in generic form, as you can see. But you will recognize them because they all, ha all have this termination uh, in MAB, which means that they're monoclonal antibodies. The new WER class uh, is uh, uh, represented by trafficking inhibitors. Uh, we have an old member there, natalizumab, which has not been widely used uh, in this country, although it is approved for Crohn's disease for reasons that I'll review in a little bit, and a, a recently, very recently approved drug in this class called vitalizumab, which uh, is gaining some traction right now. So this is sort of a diagram showing how these drugs uh, are made and what are the differences among them. On the left side in gray, you have the anti-TNF-alpha drugs, uh, and the major difference between them uh, is in their degree of humanness, so to speak. So infliximab, which was the first drug approved for uh, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, is partly human, partly uh, mouse. About 25% of the molecule is derived from a mouse, as opposed to the newer drugs such as adalimumab and golimumab, which are uh, almost 100% human. So they are basically designed based on a human immunoglobulin platform. Sertolizumab, uh, pigol instead is only the, the uh, uh, business end of a, an immunoglobulin, so the sticky fragments, which are in dark gray uh, on the right side of the uh, dark green on the right side of the diagram, uh, and th uh, this business end is tied to uh, what we call polyethylene glycol molecule, or just an in inert carrier. Finally, the trafficking inhibitor. They're they're both hybrid molecules, so they have a sm very small component of, of uh, um, animal immunoglobulin and about 95 percent of them are human and that includes natalizumab and vitalizumab. So how do they work? This is basically the mechanism, a diagram showing the mechanism of action uh, of these drugs. Uh, on the left side you have these immune cells which are part of the white cells traveling through blood vessels towards the intestinal wall where they cause inflammation and as you can see here TNF-alpha is a primary driver uh, for uh, the activated T cells. In the lumen of the bowel we have a number of, of microbes or microorganisms as well as uh, food uh, constituents or food particles. So what happens in patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, there is an excess number of these activated T cells in the intestine which causes the inflammation and the bowel damage. So how do uh, anti-TNF-alpha drug works? They not only block, but they actually neutralize, so they literally they knock out, terminate uh, a, a number of these uh, activated T cells, and by that reduction they decrease the inflammation, and basically that leads to uh, remission and maintenance of remission. In contrast, trafficking inhibitors, also called anti-integrins, they do not have a direct effect on the cells that are already migrated, that are already causing a riot in the bowel wall, but they prevent other uh, newcomers from uh, crossing the blood vessels into the bowel tissue. So they're literally traffic inhibitors, just like policemen preventing the exit from the highway. And because these cells, all the, uh, ha these activated cells have a limited lifespan, eventually they will literally uh, uh, die out, and the result of that is a, uh, an improvement in inflammation. Now, just simply thinking about the mechanism of action, it's very clear that anti-TNF-alpha drugs will work a lot faster as opposed to these trafficking inhibitors, which take a little longer to uh, see the results because they basically, uh, uh, the uh, inflammatory cells have to disappear on their own uh, from the inflamed areas. So this is a more direct comparison between anti-TNF drugs and trafficking inhibitors. So anti-TNF drugs are quicker. Uh, they work for both UC and Crohn's. Uh, they're uh, administered as an infusion or shot, so they're available in both forms. They're systemically immunosuppressive, uh, and therefore they carry a, a higher risk of uh, side effects. And we know they have a well-established long-term efficacy. In contrast, traffic inhibitors have slower onset of action. They're also effective for both UC and Crohn's. Currently, they're only available as an infusion. 
at least vedolizumab is safer because it's uh, gut selective. Natalizumab, that was one of, one of its drawbacks, is that it was preventing uh, the effect of these immune cells in both gut and brain, and therefore it was associated with an infection, a brain, viral brain infection called PML. Also, being relatively new, the long-term efficacy of these drugs is unknown, or although we're beginning to accumulate information in this uh, regard. So what are the risks of these drugs? And this is one of the most important questions that we have to field in the office, both at the beginning as well as during treatment for patients with IBD. Uh, and this, these are all examples taking, uh, taken in consideration 10,000 patients treated for one year. And obviously at the top of, of this list, even if it's not in the uh, order of, of frequency, is lymphoma because everybody wants to know about the risk of cancer. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a disease that is not uncommon in the general population, and that rate is about 1 in 5,000, and that's in the general healthy U.S. population. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma on immunomodulator is about twice to three times as common, so 4 to 6 per 10,000 patients. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma on anti-TNF drugs about the same rate, 4 to 6, so about 1 in 2,500 patients. Hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, which is a very severe form of lymphoma, is fortunately very uncommon. So that's one in about 20,000 uh, patients treated. Usually we see this in patients who receive combination of anti-TNF and an immunomodulator, uh, mostly young males as well. Death from sepsis, whether it's related to medications or the disease itself, is very comparable with the risk of lymphoma. Um, and again, it's important to keep in mind here that lymphomas, even if they're a very serious diagnosis, and most of them are treatable and, in fact, curable. Uh, death is obviously irreversible. Tuberculosis, we very frequently see this in the United States, but it is not that uncommon in developing countries. And the rate that I quoted you there uh, is overall derived from IBD studies, so it's more of a worldwide rate rather than in the United States. In the United States, the rate of tuberculosis currently is extremely, extremely rare, uh, with some regionality, of course. So in comparison, just to kind of put things in perspective about risks of drugs versus risks of normal daily life, and I showed there the death in a car accident in the United States. This is frequency per year. Uh, 4 per 10,000, which, as you're looking at the previous slide, is uh, very similar. And again, keep in mind that death is irreversible. Uh, lymphomas are treatable. Death in a household accident, just simply being at home, uh, 1.5 per 10,000. And, and surprisingly or not, that rate is higher in married people. Uh, a lifetime risk of a lightning strike, and I put it there as a lifetime risk. Uh, because as opposed to lymphoma, which tends to happen only once, uh, you can get a lightning strike every year. Uh, and that's also about 1.5 per 10,000, even if mortality is not uh, a tantamount to a strike. Risk of a mother dying from birth of a single child in this country is still at 1 in about 10,000. So just to put things in perspective uh, uh, with things that are a little closer to home. And these diagrams basically show, again, uh, the balance between risks and benefits with therapy. This specifically addresses the biologics. Uh, the chart shows 1,000 people who receive treatment with the biologic, let's say, for inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the uh, people in gray have not responded. The people in green had good response, and people in red uh, had infections from therapy or the disease. Uh, on the next slide, I basically am showing people who developed infections related to therapy uh, divided into those who developed infections related to the disease, for instance, an abscess in Crohn's disease versus uh, infections restricted to the medication use. So obviously that's only about half of the overall risk of infections. And then if we exclude preventable infections such as flu and pneumonia, the number of uh, serious infections related to drugs is even smaller. Uh, in comparison, the benefit obviously stays the same. Now, the risk of lymphoma is even uh, harder to represent on a chart like this because obviously it is less than one in a thousand, but I tried to show it there. It's uh, probably the, uh, just the head or shoulders of one of these little uh, 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 people on the chart. So uh, again, 
putting things in perspective, the benefits uh, certainly outweigh the risks with uh, virtually any form of therapy for IBD. So one of the questions uh, I think that was asked from the audience early on is how long can I stay? Do I need to stay? How long should I stay on biologic drugs? Uh, and this is, uh, they're very, I, I keep telling my patients there are similarity between IBD therapy and marriage. And what this slide says is that I don't need a perfect relationship. I just uh, relationship. I just need someone who won't give up on me. And that's the exam, exact same principle that we use, uh, particularly in relation to biologics. So uh, we like to use this drug. We like to keep the drug that won't give up on the patient, and that is the key to uh, long-term success. So moving on to drugs in the pipeline, everything that I discussed about so far is it's already available. Uh, for use by prescription, of course. Drugs in the pipeline, uh, biologic drugs, I think one of the most major developments in the upcoming years are biosimilars. These are essentially equivalent to generic biological agents and of course based on patent expirations, uh, anti-TNF drugs will be first in this direction. They're currently available on small scale in Asia uh, in some countries in Eastern Europe, but they're awaiting approval for uh, the rest of the European countries and they may see the U.S. shores in the next couple of years or so. Uh, we also have, in, in terms of biologic drugs, we have new targets for monoclonal antibodies, so they're no longer anti-TNF or TNF alpha restricted. Uh, we have a drug that's currently approved, uh, it's called Eustachinumab or Stelara. It is currently approved for treatment of psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, and it's uh, currently undergoing trials in patients with Crohn's disease. It seems to be efficacious, and this is very important, it seems to be efficacious in patients who have failed anti-TNF therapy, but again, currently not, a, not approved for uh, the treatment of Crohn's. We also have uh, new traffic inhibitors, which are in clinical trial, uh, and we literally saw an explosion of uh, uh, drugs in the pipeline uh, in this uh, uh, direction or in this uh, category of drugs. And again, the main reason for this is that because they overall seem to be safer uh, as uh, immunosuppressants. They're relatively gut restricted, so they have much, much fewer systemic side effects. Uh, among the ones that are in advanced clinical trials now uh, are etralizumab, AMG181, AJM300. As you can see, these guys don't even have a name yet. Uh, but we're likely to see them um, available for clinical use in the next two to three years or so. Uh, and as I said earlier, which is a pattern with uh, vetolizumab, they are likely to be effective for both uh, UC and Crohn's disease. The other uh, very exciting development is now in the area of small molecules. So as opposed to all biologic drugs, which are large molecules, they're immunoglobulins, uh, and they're targeted. These are uh, basically drugs that can be produced in a regular pharma pharmaceutical plant. Uh, they're all oral drugs, in a way comparable with azathioprine, but with a much narrower spectrum and much higher efficacy. In fact, their efficacy is similar to anti-TNF drugs. So they have obvious advantages being uh, oral tablets. Uh, there's no loss of response, and so once you respond, there's no resistance because there's no antibody formation. Obviously, they have their own uh, set of side effects. We have one representative in this category. It's called tofacitinib uh, or Zelgens, which is approved for treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. And this belongs to a class that I'm sure you'll hear more about in the future called JAK inhibitors. So a number of others are in clinical trials and we're currently conducting one at our institution. Other uh, agents uh, are super probiotics, so to speak. So the one representative in this class that's still remaining are the pig whipworm uh, eggs. Uh, we have a trial currently at Virginia Mason for ulcerative colitis, but they have shown, unfortunately, no benefit for Crohn's disease. It is an extremely safe form of therapy, however, as we're trying to demonstrate in this trial, so hopefully it will work. But I just want to draw your attention and make you aware of scams. There's plenty of sites online that are willing you to sell uh, to sell you this, and and I strongly caution you again against using these without medical advice, without talking to a physician, and again preferably within the confines of a clinical trial. Um, 
bone marrow transplant, this is really not a new idea. This started about two decades ago uh, when we were desperate uh, for other therapeutic options for patients with very severe uh, Crohn's disease. It showed promise for patients with, uh, with severe conditions, but at a substantial risk uh, death rate in most of these studies was around 1%. Uh, it did have some promising results, though, in patients who otherwise failed everything else. So there are some <clears throat> small-scale clinical trials underway, including one at the University of Washington. Uh, some treatments that failed to take off. Stem cell therapy has been around for about 10 years. Uh, phase two clinical trials had mixed results, so uh, the, the phase three, which is the more advanced, uh, closer to approval clinical trials, uh, have not been initiated or they're going very slow. Uh, plasma filtration is popular in Asia. It has not caught on in the United States because all the trials we did here show that it was ineffective. And then finally, complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, obviously, uh, Trina is more of an expert in this than I am, but uh, there are some definitions here about what constitutes a CAM. Uh, natural products, mind and body medicine, manipulation, body-based practices. I'm only going to touch on a few. Uh, there, these are particularly uh, suited for IBD patients because uh, uh, obviously we haven't had the success we were hoping with traditional medications. There are some symptoms that are still difficult to control. Uh, the, the diseases are chronic uh, with need for chronic therapy and all of the medications uh, that we use in traditional medicine have side effects, and particularly the steroids. So what form of com complementary uh, alternative medication do patients with IBD use? This is based on a study done about 10 years ago. First of all, between almost half of patients with IBD use some form of complementary therapy, and you have the breakdown in the slide between herbal supplements, probiotics, uh, alternative practices including yoga, relaxation, diets have really taken off in the last uh, 10 years or so, I must say that there is no evidence that they are uh, directly beneficial. Uh, so choose the diet that is uh, certainly safe and, and well balanced. Probiotics, and we kind of touched upon on this uh, earlier, uh, these are good bacteria that we're hoping that they can restore the balance in the, uh, the balance of bacteria in the GI tract. They may ha have some benefit in patients with irritable bowel syndrome, so spastic colon mostly in those with bloating and gassiness as well as in patients with antibiotic related diarrhea. May also have some efficacy in patients with mild ulcerative colitis, but there, there is no benefit in Crohn's disease. And in the patients with UC, the effect is restricted to certain preparations which have a high concentration of bugs. So among the products, there are literally hundreds of them. I listed the ones that are uh, more reputable and, and they have at least some science behind them. VSL number three, certainly the most studied probiotic uh, or in the category of probiotics. Uh, there are a number of others including lactobacillus, uh, also known as flora Q, cultural and the line. So since these are non-standardized, they may not contain the amount of bacteria that's advertised. So again, I caution you about the use of anything that's out there with the exception of perhaps a handful of brands that you can see and also uh, without discussing with your uh, uh, health care, uh, uh, with your, with your uh, physician. Other alternatives, curcumin uh, as an extract from turmeric uh, may have some benefit in patients with ulcerative colitis. There are some trials underway in Asia uh, showing early promise. It hasn't uh, really hit as far as uh, the, uh, as far as clinical trials in the United States, but we may see some uh, thing happening. And I, I must emphasize here that uh, we have had many, many quote-unquote uh, curcumins in the past which have shown uh, a great benefit when they were used uh, in open-label fashion, but when we compare them with placebo, they all failed. So yes, it is a safe drug. Uh, it is basically a, a spice. Uh, but uh, again, uh, some word of caution, in particular in regards to the source. Fish oil supplements containing omega-3 fatty acids very, very frequently used not only by IBD patients but by the general public. Uh, no benefit in IBD, but they're certainly very safe. They may have indirect benefits in other categories as antioxidants and cardiovascular disease prevention. 
Vitamin D I'm actually very excited about because there is indirect evidence showing that it's an immunomodulator. Uh, there is a seasonal variation, particularly in the northern, the northern hemisphere. And there's actually some data showing that it may prevent flares of both inflammatory bowel disease, multiple, multiple sclerosis, as well as other immune-mediated conditions. So we are actually uh, checking vitamin D levels in all our patients regularly, and we're aggressively, so to speak, supplementing it uh, as necessary. It is one of the most cost-effective interventions if it's effective because vitamin D is relatively cheap and extremely safe recognizing that there is a ceiling for everything. So uh, the rule of more is better does not apply here. A dose of about 2,000 uni units daily is uh, about as good as it gets. <coughs> Excuse me. So how about marijuana? This is something that, um, you know, is familiar in both states that hosted this or were part of the Super Bowl last year. Uh, and it's likely going to spread through the rest of the country. There's no evidence of benefit specifically for IBD. There has been some retrospective studies showing some benefit for treating symptoms which are common in IBD patients such as nausea, loss of appetite, and malaise. Be cautious or generally caution people about side effects. So at least in uh, the state of Washington and Seattle we s we've seen a skyrocketing of this condition called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome which is incessant vomiting related to marijuana uh, has at least tripled uh, since it was legalized uh, about a year ago. So it has a relatively narrow spectrum of efficacy uh, bordering between benefit and side effects. So the most important part of uh, complementary medications or the most important rules make sure it's safe. Uh, not necessarily with the drugs that I mentioned earlier, but there have been cases of liver failure, transplantation, and death following a variety of Chinese herb uh, product administrations. Uh, again, these are not regulated, they're not standardized. Mo also very important, please enter your complementary medications or complementary products if you use them uh, on your medication list when uh, you see your uh, practitioner. So key points or summary of uh, the presentation. Uh, medications are tailored based on disease severity uh, and in general we, we match uh, the disease activity with the drug effectiveness. Uh, we no longer, you no longer have to fail something before uh, you move on to the next level if patients have severe disease. For all medications used in IBD the benefits are more substantial than side effects otherwise we would not use them. There is no perfect drug and none uh, we think will be available soon. All medications have side effects, but the disease itself has more side effects than any other uh, medication used. There's obviously plenty of room for improvement with current medications, so therefore I, I do not discourage patients from using complementary medications, but medications, whether traditional or complementary, only work if they're taken uh, regularly. And if you take something, say something, whether it's prescription, alternative, over-the-counter, clinical trials. I can't say how many times I had patients who were enrolled in other centers in clinical trials. They came to us for a second opinion. They forgot to tell us about the fact that they were taking a medi medication that was under study. Uh, so obviously that caused a little bit of a stir, uh, both uh, in our institution as well as in the uh, center where they were participating. So keep that in mind. And these are a list of references uh, and additional resources. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, most of them are available through the CCFA website. There are some books, uh, including the Guide to Crohn's Disease and Ulcerative Colitis. And for those of you who are social media fans, I also put my Twitter uh, uh, handle well, there. I, I uh, uh, tweet, tweet informa informa exclusively, exclusively about, about uh, Updates, updates in, uh, in uh, IBD, IBD and, nothing else. and nothing else. And with this, and with uh, this, like uh, I would like to uh, thank conclude. You very much uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Kiorian. We have a number of questions here for you. Um, if you are in a deep medical remission with Crohn's, documented by clinical symptoms, as well as colonoscopy, do you ever step down therapy? 
So that is a question so that, that, is a question uh, that we're facing, uh, actually, we're facing fairly actually fairly frequently. frequently. Uh, and uh, and if you ask me this question 10 years ago, I would say never. never. But, but nowadays, in a select group, group of patients who have complete, complete remission, and by that I mean symptoms, symptoms endoscopy, laboratory tests, we do either reduce immunosuppression, if that's the case, so for instance, if they're on two drugs, we may discontinue one of them. I have also uh, occasionally decreased the dose to clear the biologic. Generally, generally, I do not, not encourage any patient to discontinue all medical, medical treatment completely because, because generally, generally the outcome is not favorable and uh, uh, there, may there may be major, major, major complications um, from, from players. players. Great. And here's a question from someone. What, what medications can work for somebody who has Crohn's, colitis, and celiac disease? So, so obviously, obviously these are three uh, different, different conditions. In general, in general you can only have Crohn's disease or also colitis. There's, 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 there's no combination of uh, these two conditions. conditions. Uh, there, there is, is a situation, situation where, where the disease has an inflammatory itself, so we call, so we call that, that indeterminate colitis or undifferentiated. Um, um, in, in general, general, we generally, generally treat those, those patients as patients with more moderate, moderate or severe um, uh, uh, Crohn's, Crohn's disease. disease. Interestingly, Interestingly enough, enough, celiac, celiac disease and other Crohn's or UC are not very, very commonly associated. Now, now people, people with either Crohn's or UC can have gluten tolerance, tolerance which is not, not the same thing as having celiac, celiac disease. With celiac, with celiac disease, there is small bowel damage. With, damage. with gluten, gluten intolerance, tolerance, there isn't. Gluten intolerance is just simply the fact that people develop symptoms when they eat gluten, but gluten itself is not toxic or doesn't have any other harmful effects on the body, as opposed to patients with celiac disease where gluten triggers a new reaction, which leads to bowel damage. Okay, great. And here's another question. If one family member has Crohn's disease, are there any steps that we can take to prevent other siblings from developing the disease? Yeah, yes, it's a great question that uh, I frequently hear from my patients, and, and my best advice is to have them uh, follow a healthy diet, avoid smoking, and uh, just monitor their symptoms. Um, I would not test anybody, whether by genetic means or any other means, unless they have symptoms. And we have, and we have to, to recognize that the risk of transmission from generation to generation is actually quite small. So. Um, only, only eight percent of uh, uh, patients from Crohn's disease have a first degree relative of Crohn's, 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 Crohn's disease, and, and it's a smaller percentage. Uh, four, four to five percent of patients are also have colitis. So, overwhelming majority of, of, of uh, offspring of patients with IBD will not have IBD. Okay, and here's another patient. I developed UC at age 69 two years ago. I've gone through all meds now on Remicade. Recently having increased loose stools, emergency. Is there any reason why I shouldn't have surgery and eliminate my use of stools? I don't think, think so. I mean, it's it's basically, you, 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 I, I would discuss with the gastroenterologist and I would discuss with the surgeon to understand clearly the options. Uh, obviously, if uh, 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 one would be in medical therapy, you would have to switch to a different drug. And, and your li uh, people, people are, are likely to rotate, rotate through, through all of the available, the available drugs at some point. point. Surgery, Surgery has its benefits. Uh, uh, it's it's part, as I said, it's partly curative. So about 80% of the time, uh, people, come people come off the drug. drug. But there, but there is a change, change in the quality of life related to surgery. Obviously, when you no longer have, have a wound, the bowel shrinks and changes, and even if you have, you have a pouch or a permanent stoma. And about 20% of patients develop complications. In their, in their small bowel or the pouch, pouch which are certain well to ulcerative well colitis or Crohn's disease. So, so uh, not, not completely off the hook, off the hook although, although the majority, majority of patients, particularly if they're in a tertiary center where they're experienced or rectal surgeons, they tend to do well. well. Um, and, and yes, yes uh, it, it is definitely something that I would that I would consider and I would discuss with uh, the IBD specialist and with an experienced colorectal surgeon. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a patient. ASAs do not benefit those with Crohn's disease, but what about using the rectal ASAs when a Crohn's disease patient has active rectal disease? Will we, they help? 
Who you do occasionally use that? I'm almost never, never alone. alone. So it's usually, usually a company gather medications, uh, uh, patients with special in particular, so we use, use that as a, 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 a uh, the addition to biologics or immunomodulators. I can't say they're incredibly effective, but I have had some patients uh, in whom uh, rectal 5-ASA were helpful to control some of their symptoms. Great. Can you speak to using allopurinol in combination with azathioprine for severe Crohn's? Absolutely. So it's not only for severe Crohn's, it's for uh, moderately active Crohn's or also for In general, this combination is something that we use for patients who are in otherwise may respond, but they're intolerant to azathioprine or 6-MP. And this, and this is based, based on the fact that azathioprine is sort of a prodrug, which has to undergo a transformation within the body, going through several steps before it reaches the end point or the, the final product, which is effective for Crohn's disease and UC. Now, along the way, all these byproducts have their own sort of evils, and one of them is particularly uh, and and one, of one of them can cause uh, liver damage or, or hepatitis. And it, and it turns out that in, in these patients, if we can, can block this uh, sort, of sort of alternative pathway, then more, more of the drug, drug will be distributed towards the end product, towards the, towards the effective product, product and, much and much less or nothing towards the liver uh, 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 harmful part or, or component. And that, and that is where this combination of azathioprine and allopurinol uh, goes. Now, I would uh, certainly restrict that to uh, physicians or to practitioners who are familiar with IBD who have used this in the past. Um, compliance and close monitoring of lab work is essential, but I have had very good results uh, in several patients in whom I use this combination. And again, the most important notion here is that uh, close follow-up is the key because uh, these drugs, both azathioprine and 6-MP, from effective, they can become super effective and, and the white tone can plummet and there can be other issues. So while on the package information of both these and 6-MP, you see that as a contraindication, uh, it is sort of a, a drug interaction that we sometimes use in practice. The American Gut and Microbiome Project showed a lack of certain classes of bacteria in Crohn's disease. How long will it be before you can purchase those as a probiotic? Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's a matter, matter of uh, uh, purchasing, purchasing these probiotics. Is basically, basically uh, finding, finding a way to administer them, them finding, finding, finding a way to distribute them to the colon, and then finding, finding a way to seed them. them. So, so this, this is sort of, sort of trying to plant palm, palm trees in Minnesota. Minnesota. You know, you know we, we all like them, they kind of look pretty, but good luck, good luck growing a palm tree outside. outside. If, it if it was that easy, we wouldn't, wouldn't have, have to use, use all these other medications and, and uh, all, the all the preparations that we have. have. And, and, and the big question, question in this situation about the gut or the, the, the microbial flora diversity in patients with UC Crohn's disease, is that a cause or effect? Because it may very well be that inflammation is the factor that drives the change in the flora and not, not that the flora, flora and the gut uh, drives drive inflammation. So that answer, the, the answer to answer that question, we don't know yet. Certainly, Certainly there are a number of projects and a number of early developments in this area, area and they all look relatively, relatively promising. promising. But, I but I think we're, we're very far away from, from the time when we can give uh, the patient a probiotic and, and the results in a cure. And I think there was a question earlier about fecal um, transplantation, which is, which is you know, very, very close, close to this question. question. Uh, so, so fecal, fecal transplantation, transplantation A, uh, is so far, as far as, far as, as we know, know, it is only effective for C. difficile. It has been tried in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It has not been shown to be effective in good quality studies. And in some studies in patients with ulcerative colitis, actually, it, uh, it has made some patients worse. So it's currently not recommended, although I must say that uh, it, it is in uh, under study, so there are a couple of clinical trials uh, addressing this specific uh, question. One of them was just completed at University of Washington, and we're waiting to see the results. And the other one is underway um, at University of Chicago. So I, I would discourage people from using fecal transplantation. There are definite risks associated with it. And again, the effectiveness has only been shown for C. difficile. You said diet has not shown any benefit. What studies have actually been conducted? Can you cite any of those? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, about 10 years ago, the probably the best data comes from a pediatric study, uh, which was a multi-center study. Uh, one of the authors was Markowitz. And basically what that showed is that elemental diet, meaning, you know, broken down, pre-digested diet, was effective in children. And in fact, it was uh, as effective as steroid use. Now, from there to the adult population, all of the trials that have been tried and there were good quality studies, meaning compared to placebo, have shown were negative. And one of the reasons um, for which I think we cannot use very easily this elemental diet is, is uh, it is not very palatable. So the taste is terrible. Most adults won't use it long term. In children, it was a little bit easier because it was given as a uh, quote-unquote gavage, so they were given it using uh, nasal tubes so that to bypass the taste problem. But outside of the pediatric community, in adults, uh, any type of elemental diet or polymeric diet has not shown any benefit. There are some other trials they're trying to, to uh, they're hinting more at prebiotic diets, so not necessarily the diet itself, but they're trying to modulate the flora in uh, the bowel in patients with UC and Crohn's disease, and we'll see what those show. But again, uh, the, the advice that I give my patients now is uh, what's a healthy diet for a normal person, it's a healthy diet for an IBD patient. Okay, um, I'm in clinical remission for UC since March and have stopped the canastas suppositories. Lately, I've been feeling joint pain. What's the treatment for joints? And if I choose not to take the medication for the joint pain, will it worsen? I'm still taking the salamine. Right, right, so that's an interesting question because usually the joint pains may be a harbinger for a disease flare. So I'd be very, very cautious and I'd watch uh, symptoms very closely because this could be the thunder before or the storm. Uh, about half to two-thirds of the time when, when these symptoms develop, they're an indication that the inflammation in the bowel is warming up. So I would definitely discuss this with the uh, IBD specialist. Otherwise, of the medications that are, that are effective for joints and safe for the gut, aside from acetaminophen which is, or Tylenol, which is simply a pain reliever, uh, we have a, a class of drugs called COX-2 inhibitors, and the only member of that group is uh, Celecoxib or Celebrex right now, which appears to be much safer for the gut compared to the traditional NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, Aleve, and so forth. So if uh, I uh, were to choose a medication other than acetaminophen or Tylenol, that would be the celecops, coxib, and then interestingly enough, and this is an observation that we've made over and over and over uh, for decades now, is older drugs in the 5-ASA class, and specifically sulfasalazine, are far more effective for joint pains compared to the newer drugs, which is fewer mesalamine. So not infrequently we have used, um, uh, we, uh, sometimes we have switched patients from uh, pure mesalamine to sulfasalazine, but some, occasionally you can use them in combination. So we decrease a little bit the dose of 5-SA and we add a, a small dose of, of sulfasalazine just to kind of help with uh, uh, joint pain relief. So yes, those are a few options for other uh, advice, in particular for symptoms that are more severe or refractory. I would definitely discuss with the rheumatologist. Uh, but in general, the, the, the important point here is be, be careful about an upcoming flare or uncontrolled disease activity. These, these things are frequent uh, harbingers of uncontrolled disease. Okay. And how long can it take to find out if Intivio is actually effective or not after you begin the infusions? Yes, yes, great, great question. question. So, so short, short answer, answer is, is longer, longer than, than with uh, uh, all, all the other, the other biologics, biologics, longer, longer than anti-TNF anti drugs. If uh, you have been on an anti-TNF drug before, it's about twice as long. So in the clinical studies, uh, about 90% of the response was seen at 10 weeks, which is almost a month later compared to anti-TNF. And the response, the, the response really doesn't peak until about six months down the road. So these drugs continue to slowly, slowly inch up even six months after they're started. However, if people have not responded after 10 to 12 weeks, they probably won't respond no matter how long they continue. So that applies to vedolizumab. It's likely to be a class effect. I think all of the medications in this class, all these trafficking inhibitor inhibitors are probably going to behave the same way.
Do you think biologicals in particular, the NTVO has any benefit with uh, patients with PSC? Yeah, that's a great question. This comes from somebody who knows a lot more than they're saying. So uh, it's interesting that the, the um, uh, receptors or, or basically these molecules that are blocking on the immune cells, uh, essentially what they do is they facilitate the interaction or the migration of these uh, uh, immune cells from, from the blood vessels to the tissue. And they're essentially a key in a hole. So the key is, for instance, on the lymphocyte and the hole is on the blood vessel. Well, this match, this uh, perfect match between the key and the hole, uh, uh, at least with uh, with this molecule that we're blocking with vetolizumab is only in the gut and some of the biliary system. So theoretically, theoretically, and I emphasize that, a drug like vetolizumab may be effective for patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Now, the humongous caveats here are when the, the clinical trials with, with vetolizumab were started, so this is the Gemini program, they specifically excluded patients with PSC, and the reason for that are myriad. Um, and uh, number two, we, we so we don't know uh, what the effectiveness of this is and how long would it take to work. Number two, it also depends on the stage of disease. So obviously there's a small duct, there's early PSC, and there's late PSC. Um, I think there are efforts underway to start a clinical trial with vetolizumab in PSC patients, but until we have that result, um, I don't think there is a, a direct indication for vetolizumab in patients with PSC. However, if the patient also has active ulcerative colitis, that certainly may, I would make the case, at least theoretically, that this would be a drug to choose. Great. Okay. Well, Dr. Kieran, I'm going to bring you back to diet. We have a few patients that want you to discuss diet again. and. Um, one of them wants to know if you don't recommend GAPS or the SCD or autoimmune paleo, and they wanted you to discuss the study at Children's Hospital on the SCD diet. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the, I can start with the latter because uh, the uh, Children's Hospital had um, basically three patients where they use SCD, uh, which is a, a special carbohydrate diet. Um, and and they showed improvement in clinical symptoms. Now, but for all intents and purposes, when we study something for inflammatory bowel disease, we, we use at least one, if not several, objective uh, markers of disease activity, laboratory tests, endoscopy, radiology. Uh, the, the study that was published from the Children's Hospital had a very, very, very small number of of children, and again, their only disease response was as far as symptoms. So many other diets can lead to symptom improvement in everybody, not only in patients with IBD, but from there to say that a diet is effective for controlling IBD, I think there's a little bit of a distance. Uh, as far as the special carbohydrate diet, so yes, uh, it is um, uh, somewhat on vogue, and I must say that I uh, probably uh, have seen a couple of dozen patients in the last year with SCD um, referred to me. Uh, I had a few who said they felt better. I had a few where the disease hasn't changed. I had about uh, a good handful or so uh, who had disastrous consequences, massive weight loss. In, in fact, you know, uh, in the end, they became so sick that basically we had a hard time we had difficulty treating them with, with traditional medication. So uh, I think if people want to uh, go on any specific diet, I would strongly recommend that they discuss this with a dietitian or a, a naturopathic physician, but make sure they keep a, a good balance between all the important principles of nutrition, so protein, carbohydrates, and fat, um, so that to avoid uh, side effects. Okay, can you um, make some comments on the MAP bacterium as a cause in the trials of the triple antibiotic? Right, right. So the MAP stands for Mycobacteria avium intracellularis, uh, or basically uh, a family of drugs that are uh, remotely related to tuberculosis. And the story goes almost uh, 50, 60 years ago where um, a, a common disease in cattle called Jones disease was related to one of these uh, bugs, to mycobacteria. And just 
because under cross-eye, just by physical exam, by looking at the intestine in, in, these, uh, in these cows, the intestine looked similar to the intestine of patients with Crohn's disease. People started drawing parallels. And this is, again, 50, 60 years in the making. Uh, started to draw parallels between tuberculosis, mycobacterial infection in general, and Crohn's disease in particular. Now, since then, there have been a very, very large number of studies with very mixed results as far as the frequency of these microbes in the guts of patients with Crohn's disease. And, and the conclusion of the good quality ones was that these guys are just colonizing. So they find an area of the gut that's inflamed, they set shop there, but they don't cause any direct damage. And probably the most direct evidence uh, for this was a study that was done about seven, eight years ago from Australia, a two years long study where they treated patients with uh, tuberculosis antibiotics essentially, which is also effective for MAC. And uh, while it showed an initial early benefit, uh, modest, uh, in the first three months, at two years there was absolutely no difference between patients who receive triple antibiotics versus those who receive placebo. There is another study with a similar combination, different dose, uh, certainly something that I, I think it deserves to be studied. And um, that is basically my recommendations. My recommendation, if people with Crohn's disease are, are interested to see if the, the, uh, these antibiotics work, I would only do it within the confine of a clinical trial not only for safety reasons, but because we're also trying to answer this question. But again, so far, I'm a bit skeptical uh, whether this will be effective or not based on the, the previous evidence. How does the medication Linzas work for Crohn's patients with constipation? So it works like any other constipation relieving drug. It, it is no better or worse than the simple remedies for constipation, such as fiber supplements, uh, Miralax. Uh, the only caveat, so there's two, actually two big caveats here. Uh, a, constipation and Crohn's disease can be a sign of bowel blockage, bowel obstruction. So be very, very careful about using any uh, constipation drug in this situation. Make sure you discuss this with your, your IBD specialist and make sure that they're ruling out a bowel blockage uh, because that is obviously not a good combination. And number two situation where we see this in patients who use very large uh, or, or good, uh, uh, substantial doses of pain medication, specifically uh, narcotics, which uh, have uh, the side effect of constipation as a, a very well described side effect. Now in that situation, Obviously, I would go up the ladder uh, and start with over-the-counter uh, mild laxatives, including, as I said, Miralax, and move up to uh, other medications, including potentially Linzess. It, it is not necessarily, it hasn't been shown to be more effective than the other medications in this situation. And again, in general, we refrain from using it in patients with Crohn's disease for fear of an existing bowel blockage where it can lead to uh, worsening symptoms or worse symptoms. Okay, great. Um, we're down to the last few questions. So if anybody has any more questions, send them in. Um, if someone starts to lose response to infliximab and has already failed Humira, where do you go next? So, so it depends on the condition. But uh, so you're you're in good company. Uh, you know, 70, 60, 70 percent of people do lose response to one or more of these drugs, and generally that's based on on uh, development of antibodies, which we we can now by by the way measure. So there are uh, three uh, drugs, three biologic drugs in this class approved for each indication. So uh, uh, Remicade, Humira are approved for both. Symphony is approved for ulcerative colitis, and Simsia is approved for Crohn's disease. So depending on the condition, you can try the third one. Uh, certainly when we see uh, a rapid loss of response to biologics, we use combination therapy almost universally. So uh, if I would add an immunomodulator if uh, the patient is not already on it. And then finally, if all three drugs have uh, uh, essentially ran out of gas, then we switch, we switch class and we, uh, we uh, start patients on, on vetalizumab or NTBO. Okay, um, I haven't heard anything mentioned about exercise. Is this helpful for Crohn's patients? Very helpful. So, uh, and and it's not only helpful to to campaign for 
IBD, you all know about the, the gut walks and, and take um, charge, take steps, sorry, take steps. Uh, so these are good for the body and mind, right? So uh, the, what we have recognized in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so is that moderate exercise is an amino modulator. It's, and it's probably doing that through its positive effects on the body as a whole. Uh, and I don't think there is any controversy there, nowhere near uh, as, uh, as much of a controversy as with diet. So yes, regular exercise, uh, it is good for everybody, including patients with IBD. Now the question is about strenuous exercise. And this is the gut marathons, and, and we're all very proud when our patients can participate. The only point of caution there is I tell my patients if they're if they have active disease to try to slow it down so maybe mini marathons just don't push the limits because um, we're not sure what it can do to the body um, why what, what are, why are other reasons that exercise is good other than overall health and and uh, healthy mood um, you know the it, it may combat some of the side effects from medications, and, and here we're talking uh, especially about steroids, steroids-induced osteoporosis and muscle mass, lo muscle mass loss. These are all things that can be counteracted very effectively by regular exercise, moderate weight-bearing exercise, uh, and so forth. And also the recovery of bone and muscle tissue after the use of steroids is a lot faster uh, with exercise. Okay, well, clearly you have good endurance, Dr. Kirian. We're down to the last question. So uh, my daughter suffers with Crohn's disease. I suffer from several autoimmune diseases, but not Crohn's. Is there a connection? Yeah. Yes, I saw this question earlier. It's actually a, a very interesting one. So there is a limited spectrum of, of uh, uh, um, sort of cross reactivity or inheritance. And it turns out that neither Crohn's nor ulcerative colitis are associated with the broader spectrum of autoimmune disease, which includes lupus, thyroid disorders, uh, skin disorders, with a few exceptions. So we do see some association with rheumatoid arthritis. We do see some association with uh, psoriasis and a little bit of an association in uh, close relatives with multiple sclerosis. Outside of that, uh, this is the good news is that these conditions are not related to the uh, overall wider class of autoimmune disorders. So in general, we can reassure patients that if they have UC or Crohn's disease, they're not going to develop a universal autoimmune disease of sorts. Now, that said, patients with both UC and Crohn's disease can, can develop other manifestations which are driven by their uh, bowel disease, and that includes some skin disorders, eye disorders. Uh, but the good news about that is that once we have control of their bowel disease, their other uh, uh, body systems also get better. Um, so in, in short, no major cross-reactivity with other autoimmune conditions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kurian. That was very informative, and it's always nice to see what uh, the future research holds and future drugs are coming. I guess patients can follow you on Twitter. Uh, maybe we'll see you out for Team Challenge next season. Um, do you have any final announcements, Kathleen? Um, at the end of your uh, talk here, a survey will come up. And if you could please fill that out. It takes only a moment. We'd appreciate that. Good night.